Hello, this is Miss Dagan Ford, and this is going to be our introduction to Unit 6, uh, which includes DNA, RNA, protein synthesis, gene expression, and regulation of gene expression. Uh, now, we're going to dive in first with some background information that's going to be super helpful to understand the importance of DNA and RNA and how we came to this monumental discovery. So a little bit of background information. In the 1800s, as, as our story unfolds, in the 1800s, we knew from Mendel's work uh, in the middle 1800s that animals and plants show genetic variation, but we didn't know how it occurs. Mendel only knew that there was a factor that was being passed down. Now in the late 1800s, <clears throat> we discovered uh, nucleic acids. Like we knew that there was this group of molecules and they called them nucleic acids, but we didn't really know what they did. In fact, they seem to appear pretty boring. Nucleic acids are really sugar, phosphate, and four to five nitrogen containing bases. So they weren't really that exciting chemically. And in fact, for the longest time, scientists just assumed that the nucleus, which is where they found nucleic acids, they at first thought it was just a storehouse of phosphorus, like a big storage tank. Uh, so if you contrast that with proteins, especially at the time, they were finding more and more and more proteins and proteins seemed a lot more interesting and a lot more variable compared that to a nucleic acid, which really only had those three components. It didn't seem that interesting. So when they started to think about what might be the cause of genetic information, they quite naturally presumed that proteins would be a more natural candidate proteins where you have thousands of them versus DNA where you only have four nucleotides. <clears throat> now many thought so my, many scientists thought that proteins were the genetic material. Now one clue to keep in mind uh, for this little story, uh, proteins are made of amino acids. If you recall back in the beginning of the year, we learned this proteins are made of amino acids and amino acids have nitrogen and sulfur, but notice they don't have any phosphorus. Contrast that nucleic acids, which are made of nucleotides, they contain nitrogen and phosphorus, but not sulfur. So that's going to come back in our story. A little foreshadowing there. Uh, so our first uh, chapter in our story would be Fred Griffin, who Griffith, who in the 1920s, he was studying a vaccine for pneumonia. And in the 1920s, pneumonia was a big deal. If you ended up with pneumonia, there was a very good chance that you might die in the 1920s. So we really did worry about that. And so naturally there were a lot of scientists and doctors who were trying to figure out if we could find a vaccine. Now, uh, what we did know is that there were two forms of pneumonia, uh, streptococcus pneumonia. Now, uh, streptococcus is a bacteria that kind of exists in two little clumps, two cells. Uh, that would be the strepto part, and coccus refers to the shape, the spherical shape. So streptococcus pneumonia ends up being this pair of bacteria that kind of stick together. <clears throat> now, we knew... Uh, Fred Griffith knew that there were two forms of the bacteria. We have a smooth bacteria versus a rough. Uh, the smooth bacteria produces a very thick capsule made of polysaccharides and water and some proteins thrown in, and this makes it very slippery. This is an encapsulated uh, bacteria. It has a that capsule around it. The immune cells struggle to engulf the S, the smooth bacteria. Now what this means is when bacteria try to catch it, they just can't engulf it very easily. And that makes it dangerous. So the S bacteria is virulent. And then the other form, the rough coat, the rough bacteria, streptococcus, they don't make the capsule which means that it's very easy for the white blood cells to engulf it and bring it inside. So the rough 
streptococcus pneumonia is a virulent or harmless uh, or certainly le certainly less harmful uh, it's very easy for you to get over that case because you don't really get sick the white blood cells can engulf it very easily so here is a, uh, a picture of Fred Griffith and here's a white blood cell engulfing the streptococcus so Fred Griff Griffith um, has uh, gone down in history with this very, very simple yet very important experiment. And it used mice, it used R cells, and it used S cells. Now, as part of our video, I'm going to ask you to think about what um, is going to happen, make some predictions, and you're going to be asked to do this on your Ed Puzzle video. So the first two conditions, you can almost imagine these would be pretty important controls because you know that our cells are going to uh, be a virulent. So think about what's going to happen if you inject living R cells into a mouse. What you want to think about is will the mouse survive or will the mouse die? So give it some thought. <clears throat> and you would have asked, been asked to record your thoughts. The other experiment, which again is a form of control, you're going to um, inject with live S cells. Now, S cells are the virulent kind of bacteria. They have that capsule. So keep in mind, they're going to cause pneumonia. So if you inject S cells into a mouse, make a prediction. What do you think is going to happen? All right, so you've made your predictions. Let's just go ahead and test it. Uh, if you inject it with live R cells, the mouse remains healthy. Uh, if you inject it with S cells, the mouse dies. And then when you um, isolate in the blood and, and grow the bacteria in the blood, what you would see is that the Petri dish would have R cells in the case of injecting with S cell, uh, R cells, and then S cells if you inject it with S cells. Makes sense. Uh, so on your copy of your slides, you can real quickly describe the experiment, describe the results, and then explain the results. Uh, you're going to do the same thing on the next one. So the next slide, let me go back to present. Uh, I would like you to think about what happens if you heat the S cells and then as you heat them, of course, the S cells die. So when you heat kill the S cells and then inject those dead S cells, would you expect the mouse to live or die? Okay, so you were asked to make your prediction. Uh, and then the last stage, we're going to put live R cells and plus heat killed S cells. Now, keep in mind, um, if you inject live R cells, the live R cells allow the mouse to live. And the heat killed S cells, well, you've just destroyed the bacteria. The bacteria are no longer alive. So the mice live in that situation. Now, this is what really caused some confusion. So uh, let's go over this a little bit. In, in the mouse that got the heat killed S cells, the mice remain healthy. And because we've killed the bacteria, when we plate these on a Petri dish, uh, you're not going to get any bacteria growing. There are no bacteria, they're dead. Uh, now, keep in mind, if you inject live R cells, which allowed the mouse to live, and dead S cells, which allowed the mouse to live, you would expect the mice to live. But one thing that they found is that sadly, with this uh, experiment, the mice died. And you can imagine this kind of created a lot of head scratching, like what was going on. And really head scratching was the fact that when we then brought the uh, blood uh, onto a Petri dish, we were finding both are, and most importantly, and most confusingly at first, S cells, live S cells. And so there kind of became this search for, you know, what in the world is going on? Now, um, what Griffith did, Griffith concluded that there was some for, uh, form of 
transformation factor or transformation principle. Now, there is a little bit of controversy, right? I mean, what's going on here? There should be no reason to, for those mice to die. Uh, and in fact, for a while, there was this idea that maybe Griffith just didn't uh, do his experiment that well. Uh, so along comes Avery McCarty and McLeod and notice there's a good decade later in 1944. And so, um, he and his researchers really sought to try to figure this out. And so he did a very clever experiment. He used heat killed S cells. Um, and then he used detergent to open them up. And so here we have our S cells, we're heating them up, we're gonna kill them, and then we're gonna use detergent to kind of open everything up. Now I color coded these things, so we have orange is RNA, green is DNA, and blue is protein. Now if you've played, uh, if you've played um, the suspect, if you have played that game, you know, I've forgotten the name of it, uh, you know that you as a team try to think up uh, the person who is the um, killer. And so if I think this red dude, if I think he's the killer, um, we as a team can um, vote him out. And if we vote him out and people still get killed, then we're kind of left with the um, understanding that, well, he's not the killer. And so um, what Avery and McCarty and McLeod did is they kind of set up a situation like this. So um, just like um, just like Among Us, if we vote somebody out, then we can see what happens. And so Avery, McCarty, and McLeod, they set up three assays, one with RNA digesting enzymes, one with protein digesting enzymes, and one with DNA digesting enzymes. And again, just like among us, if RNA is the suspect, if RNA is the transformation factor and we get rid of RNA, then we shouldn't see transformation. So follow the logic there. If I think the red guy is the killer and I vote out the red guy and he was the killer, then the killing should stop in Among Us, right? You vote somebody out. If they were the imposter, then um, if we vote out the imposter and he was the imposter, then everybody lives. Yay. Uh, but if they're not the imposter and people are still dying, then, I, then we know we didn't get the imposter. So they added RNA digesting enzymes and they... Um, that the enzymes broke down the RNA and there should be no RNA. They broke down the, the pro in another assay, they used protein digesting enzymes, which broke breaks down. Notice the proteins are gone. And so there should be no protein. And then we have our DNA digesting enzymes and notice there's no green DNA. Uh, so I'm going to let you, uh, pose, uh, 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 postulate some things. What do you think is going to happen? And we're going to answer this in our next video.